Good morning. Good morning. Hey, you guys sound so much better today. How you doing today? All right, excellent. Take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 is our diving board, and Jeremiah chapter 29 is the pool. As you're turning to Philippians chapter 4, I have really a piece of advice for you, if I can, and this is on the pastoral side of things, and then a question for you. First of all, a piece of advice. It's Thursday, and, and the sense of the impending um, next few days is resting further and further upon our shoulders, upon your shoulders here. And so let me encourage you to be bold, to ask those questions of your teachers, to ask those questions of your counselors, to ask those questions, perhaps even of your friends, that you've been like, oh, I should ask that question, but I don't know how they're going to take it. Be bold, be fearless, go ask, because this is the opportunity that you have. Uh, just one little piece of advice there. Number two is a question. And um, if you spend much time with me over time, uh, one of the things that you'll probably hear from me is what I'm about to ask you next which is what I call trivial questions, okay? Now, most of us are familiar with trivia questions. I call these trivial questions because they don't really matter in the big scheme of life. But I like to ask trivial questions because when we're waking up in the morning, our brain is going at about five miles an hour compared to what it needs to be going at, which is like 55 to 75 miles an hour, okay? So it's really a warm-up question in some ways, but uh, the question for you this morning is this. If money were not a factor, if uh, distance were not a factor, if time were not a factor, and you could go to any place in the world of your choosing right now to be content, where would it be? Okay, yes, sir. Jay, all right, excellent. Good answer, good answer. Anybody else, anybody else? Yes, sir, up there. Alaska, fantastic. Where else? Over on this side. Yes. A closet of linens. A closet of linens. Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, sorry, sorry, okay. Whoops, all right, all right, where else, where else? Yes. North Carolina. Fantastic. Yes. Hawaii. Hawaii. Wow, well, yes, sir. Wow. Wow. Okay. I don't understand that fully, but I will believe you on that. One more, one more. Yes, right here. Where? Chikatik Island, oh, with the ponies, yeah, fantastic. You may have a lot of answers uh, that, that were not mentioned here, um, particular one answer that didn't make a lot of sense to me. But anyway, um, <clears throat> when we talk about contentment, many times we associate that with a place. Many times we associate that perhaps uh, a place in our house. Maybe it's your bed with your pillow and your mattress on it. Uh, Maybe, for some of you, it's an Adirondack chair beside a lake or a chair, a beach chair beside the ocean. Maybe, for some of you, it's that tall um, glass of ice-cold Coca-Cola or Pepsi or Sobe or water. Okay, uh, any, any one of those things, that might be what you relate to some sort of contentment. But I want to talk to you about contentment today. I want to talk to you about contentment from a biblical perspective today. Again, the theme verse this week, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find help, to t- to, uh, help in time of need. Hebrews 4, 16. When we consider this, we've looked at a few different things this week. We've looked at our needs. We've looked at fear and the need for confidence. We've looked at peace 
and uh, how that helps us. Uh, today, I want to talk about finding that grace and mercy in that time of need. Because one of the things that I find interesting about that word find, if you were to focus in on that word in that verse, to find grace, it means to discover that which is already there. I want you to think about that. Many times when we think about God's grace, we think about finding it or generating it somehow. But remember, the place of God's grace is his presence, his throne, and his grace is already there. And so, when we talk about contentment, the next thing that comes to our minds often is, when we approach this throne of grace, when we approach with our preconceived ideas what God will do for us, sometimes it generates in us a discontent. A discontent, a frustration that somehow, I guess I'm not doing it right. I'm not going through the right process. In Philippians chapter 4, we are told by the apostle something incredible. He says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 10, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. This is a verse that I want us to dive off of into God's Word. It's a verse that we know perhaps by memory at this point, but I want you to pause on it for a few moments today. Because Paul identifies some really important things for us to consider. Number one, he says, I have learned. Of all the different people in the world that um, should be content, we would probably peg Paul with one of them. Yet he says he learned contentment. It was a process that he went through. It was a a thing that was not natural to him. I would almost say this, that none, none of us here are naturally content. Now, some of you know, you've heard the cliches around little babies, you know, oh, you have a naturally content baby. Oh, that's so nice. And, and naturally content babies are really a blessing to their parents and things like that. But as they grow, they stop being naturally content. Some of you were born and you were naturally content babies. You are no longer naturally content. Okay? We are not naturally content. There's a thirst in us for something more. Maybe it's more comfort. Maybe it's more challenge. Maybe it's more things in our lives. We are surrounded in a culture of a culture that that teaches us to be discontent because if you're discontent, then you can achieve great things because you'll be pursuing things. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Second thing that we learn from that verse very quickly observationally is this. His contentment that he was learning was not based on circumstances. All of you are in a circumstance right now. Meaning you are surrounded by events of your choosing and other people's choosing that um, uh, some of you love and some of you despise. One of my heartbeats for you, as we look at at next week into your lives, you are going to a place next week, and you will be tempted with discontentment. You will be tempted to be frustrated at where you are. Perhaps some of you are frustrated where you are right now. But Paul says, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. The title of this devotional today is Contentment in Hard Places. And so I want to give you some some tools to help you be content whatever place you find yourself in. And to give you those tools, those principles, if you will, I'm going to ask you now to turn to Jeremiah chapter 29. 
Jeremiah chapter 29. Perhaps one of the most miscontextualized pieces of scripture in the Bible. How many of anybody know one of the famous verses that comes from Jeremiah 29? Yes. Yes, yes, very good. Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans of welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. It's a wonderful verse. People have it plastered on their walls. They have it on placards. Uh, they have it in lots of different places. And they love that verse because it sounds so great. But so many people miss the context of where that is found. So let's look at the context for just a moment. Jeremiah chapter 29. <clears throat> Jeremiah the prophet is writing to a bunch of people who are in a hard circumstance. Their hard circumstance is this. They have been taken captive by the Babylonians. They have been uprooted from their country and displaced into the country of Babylon. The empire of Babylon. The city of Babylon. They are where they are where they do not want to be. And they've got two people talking to them. One of the guys' names is Hanani. Hanani is a prophet, at least he's a self-proclaimed prophet, and he says to them, Listen, I've had a dream. <laughs> you have a dream too. Your dream is to go back to Israel. Don't worry. Within two years, you're going back. Leave those boxes packed, leave those bags packed, and we're going back. Just give it two years. All right? Guess what Jeremiah comes along and says? He says, listen, this is what God says. You're going to be here for 70 years. Now, if you were that captive, think about yourself as a captive. Think about yourself in slavery. Think about yourself in a place that you would not want to be. And somebody says, you're going to have to be here for two years or 70 years. Which one would you choose? Let's take a poll right now. Those of you who would say, yes, I'd like to be there for two years, please raise your hand. All right? Those of you who would like to be there for the next 70 years of your life, please raise your hand. All right. We've got one person that wants to go for the 70 years. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, most of us would say, no, 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 no. Two years, that's long enough to be in a place that I don't want to be. Well, there's three principles that I see in here that I think teach us how to learn contentment. The first principle, and let's start off in verse 4, it says, Jeremiah is saying through the Lord, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, I can't, I can't read over that verse without pointing out one thing that is easily missed. Notice what God says, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile. Could the exiles blame God for their exile? The answer is yes. Now, I don't know if I would want to use the term blame... Because there were definitely some other factors that were going on in here. But even God himself says, I sent you into a hard place. Well, if somebody sends you into a hard place, then you have the right to be angry with them, right? If, if somebody sends you into a hard place, you have the right to be antagonistic to them. Isn't that what we're taught in this world? And yet, sometimes your teacher sends you into a hard place with your music, don't, don't, don't they? Sometimes your parents send you into a hard place. Sometimes your boss, sometimes a friend. But many times, the thing that makes us angry or even offended at God is, God, you could have stopped me from having to go to this hard place. Well, the first principle that he lays out to build contentment, and I want you to understand, he doesn't actually use the term contentment in here, but as I look at Paul's life and as I look at this, I see these three practical principles for contentment and how to learn contentment being found in here. So in verse 5 it says, Build houses and live in them, and plant gardens and eat their produce. 
Take wives and become fathers of sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will have welfare. First principle to learn contentment. Renew your commitment. Renew your commitment. Uh, sometimes, how many of you are looking to head into your freshman year of college uh, this coming fall? Please raise your hand. Okay. My heart goes out to you, okay? But I'm going to just tell you what I do as a pastor with freshmen, okay? When they're heading off to college. My heartbeat for freshmen is this. Listen, when you get there, some of you will absolutely love where you're going. Some of you will be like me and for the first month wish you could go home every single day. And my advice to you is this. Be committed to where you believe the Lord is leading you right now. Don't bow out after a month. Don't bow out after a week. Don't be calling your parents and saying, hey, I want to come home today and I must come home today. Let me tell you just a little bit of a story of my daughter who was a Czechie um, camper here for a number of different years. She went to a college, and uh, she, she started uh, right around the pandemic time when that all kind of blew up. <laughs> and after the first semester, I, uh, I, I, I sat her down and I said, Anna, listen, if you don't want to go back, there was a whole bunch of stuff going on on campus, it was hard, all these different things, and I said to her what I don't say to you today, (laughs) but I said to her, I said, Anna, if you want to stay home and just take classes at home, please stay home. And you know what she said to me? She said, Dad, I really, really want to stay home. But I believe more firmly that God wants me there. And so, I need to go. And I was like, I can't argue with that. She knew what God was calling her to do. And even though her desire was to stay at home, her desire was not to go back into that particular environment at that time, God's will was more important than hers. She was committed to God's will. What was the commitment looking like here? The commitment looking, was looking like this. He, he's saying, here's the guy who's saying, stay here for two years. Here's the guy who's saying, stay here for 70 years. The guy that's saying, stay for two years, is very appealing to the majority of the people at that time. And so to hear the next piece of advice, settle down. Build your houses. Raise children. Marry them off. I think perhaps one of the hardest ones is at the end of verse 7. And pray to God on the city's behalf that you are in exile, for in its welfare you will have welfare. Verse 7, beginning, seek the welfare of the city. You know, one of the things that we sometimes struggle with when we're faced with something difficult is the commitment that says, I am here not just for my own good, but for the good of the people that God has put me around. Only history could tell us the wonderful benefits of these exiles being in exile in Babylon. Two years into it, you couldn't tell, for the most part. But now looking back, you could tell in a wonderful way. So so number one principle for learning contentment is renew your commitment. Don't be so fast at jumping ship. Recognize where God has put you and stay there as long as you are convinced that that's where God has put you. Number two, it says in verse 10, For thus says the Lord, When seventy years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. Now, let's just get real for a moment. Could we just be real for a moment? Take your age right now and add seventy years to it. Most of you are in the 15 to 20 average range of of age. So that means that in 70 years from now, you will be 85 to 90 years old. The prime of your life, right? 
Hopefully, <laughs> probably not statistically. And this is what God is saying to them. Listen, don't worry, have hope. 70 years from now, you're going home. Woohoo! It's going to be like, yeah, we're going home. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm home, yeah. Okay, no, no, please understand, hope. Hope is not just focused on yourself. Hope is focused on God's plan. And so the second principle is refresh your hope. Refresh your hope. Notice again, 70 years, I'm going to complete that which I've started here. I will visit you and will fulfill my good word to you. Verse 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans of welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. See, many times we want hope that the world defines as hope. Yeah, this might happen. We're going to hold on to that hope. But Romans chapter 8, verse 24 and 25 actually talks to us about hope in a very unique way. It says in Romans chapter 8, verses 24 and 25, it says this, For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not Hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance. That's the same word what we looked at yesterday. Um, uh, endurance, perseverance, uh, the idea of remaining under. If we hope for what we do not see, We remain under the difficult situations, waiting eagerly for the hope to be revealed to us. So refresh your hope. Recognize that God will always fulfill his word. Maybe not in your expected time. Maybe not even in your expected way. But when you enter that throne room, when you find that grace, it is an established grace that is there for you to be discovered day after day after day. Refresh your hope. Third principle. Refocus your perspective. Now, to help you with this, to help you with this, um, let me try to give you this perspective. <clears throat> One of the challenges that we all have is we compare ourselves to other people, don't we? We, we, we naturally do that. You've probably been doing that at camp, okay? Um, I, I, I've started doing that at camp, okay? I, I walk into the dining hall and I see Rian, okay? I walk onto the ultimate Frisbee court and I see Rian. I walk into chapel and I can't help but notice Rian here, okay? For a number of reasons, all right? We, we look at other people all the time, and we compare ourselves to them. Maybe for good, maybe for bad. We're going to talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. But one of the things that these captives, these exiles had going on was, we just want to go home, and guess what? There were still people at home. Did you know that? When, when, when the children of Israel, when, when the people from Judea were taken into the Babylonian exile, there were people that were left at home. Which would you rather? Would you rather be a slave in Babylon or at home back in Jerusalem and Judea? Okay, let's take a poll on that. Okay, if you are in the shoes of uh, the Judeans, which would you rather be? Those who, who are slaves in uh, Babylon, please raise your hand. Okay, those of you who are um, back home in Jerusalem and Judea, please raise your hand. Okay, excellent, good. You, you You have satisfied the statistical normalcy of that question. Because this is exactly the way these Judean exiles felt. It's like, we must be the bad ones here. We're stuck over here. But I want you to hear what he says in verse 15. Because you have said... The Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon. For thus the Lord, for thus says the Lord concerning the king who sits on the throne of David, and concerning all the people who dwell in this city, your brothers who did not go with you into exile. When you're struggling with discontentment, 
one of the biggest reasons you struggle with discontentment is you look at other people around you and you say, I wish I had a life like they had. And some of those people, if they knew you were thinking about that, they would say, you do not wish you had my life. But the Israelites, or excuse me, the, the Judeans in captivity, they were looking back and saying, they've got the life, they're still there, that's where I want to be. And this is what God says in verse 17. Thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I'm sending upon them, back there in Judea and Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, and pestilence. And I will make them like split open figs that cannot be eaten due to rottenness. I will pursue them with a sword, with a famine, and with pestilence, and I will make them a terror to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse and a horror and a hissing and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them, because they have not listened to my words, declares the Lord. You see, sometimes when we're struggling with contentment, we need to refocus our perspective away from looking at other people and their wonderful circumstances and bringing it back to the word of the Lord that says, the reason I took you from Judea and Jerusalem and I put you here in Babylon was to preserve a people for my own sake that I will bless, that I will help, that I will strengthen, and that I will bring back the nation. But those people who are back there, they are going to receive the divine judgment of me upon them because they would not listen to me. Contentment. Renew your commitment to where God has put you, whether you like that place or not. Number two, refresh your hope. Your hope is in the Lord. Your hope is in Him. And refocus your perspective away from comparison and on to the promises and the word of God that will never fail you. I hope that you will be content. I desire for you to be content. Hebrews 13.5 says, Be sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. But godliness is a means of great gain, when accompanied by contentment. Paul says, I have learned to be content in every circumstance. I've learned how to go with much, and I have learned to go hungry as well. Contentment is not natural, but it is something that can be learned. And I hope you will put these practices into your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this gift of contentment. Lord, let us not confuse it with complacency, but contentment in what you are doing around us. Contentment in where you have placed us. Contentment in the hope that you have established through your word. Contentment, Lord, in gazing upon you. Lord, I pray for these students today. Continue to raise them up in their health. Continue to lift them up in their spirits, embolden them, strengthen them, fill them with your grace. Lord, the next few days are busy days as we get ready to share that which we have been learning. And Lord, I pray that as we share those things, these performances, these presentations would be done to the glory and awe of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.